Okay, good evening. Thank you for being here in such large amounts. And um, uh, thank you also for everybody who organizes the uh, Tech Talk Stuttgart. It's Animation Media Creators Region Stuttgart. <laughs> and Steffi is the cluster, oh, the Creators Manager. <laughs> Say hello to Steffi. MFG, um, Medien- und Filmgesellschaft GmbH, um, Film Commission Region Stuttgart, uh, Stuttgart Media University, ADM, uh, Film Academy Baden-Württemberg with the Animationsinstitut. We're running the Tech Talks for quite some time. Usually it's in the um, Good Boat at VIS in Stuttgart, in the center of the city. But um, in fall, we usually have such a setup. And that's why we always offer to do the Tech Talks here. And tonight we'll have three exciting Tech Talks. Paul Golter, who studies with us, technical directing, will give you insights into the USD uh, pipeline for uh, the final year project. Then we'll have Max Schmier from B-Rex on Unreal Neural Radiance fields. Looking forward to see and learn about that. And then we have another Max, uh, Maximilian Pfister from Fischvergiftung, on projection mapping and creative uses of AI technology. Um, if you are not a VES member, then you should become one uh, for many reasons. And I just wanted to break to you that there is a new publication from the VES uh, on uh, a handbook on virtual production. It's very useful. Take a look. Don't take it home. Um, and then we'll have these three talks, each 10 to 15 minutes. We'll can ask questions right afterwards. And then there's um, drinks and food. And we also have a special something behind the curtain for you because last week we had a disguise workshop and they left a markerless mocap system here, which um, today we kind of were able to set it up and you can take a look at it. I found it quite well. Now, without further ado, let's listen to Paul's presentation. Thanks. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I am Paul Golter. I'm studying technical directing at uh, the Animations Institute in the last year. And a couple of years ago, I started out as a 3D generalist, but I quickly noticed that I'm always kind of very drawn to the technical topics. So I transitioned to become a pipeline TD about four years ago. And now I am developing tools and streamlining workflows. And yeah, in the next 15 minutes, I will talk about the uh, USD pipeline of our diploma project underwater here at Animations Institute. This presentation will not focus on like theoretical USD concepts, but rather show how to uh, approach a project with USD. So it's definitely useful if you already know some USD, but I hope you can still sort of follow along if you don't. Yeah, so I will first give you a little uh, project and pipeline overview. Then I will talk about how we organize our USD stages for assets and shots, and especially how all these USD files are organized on disk. And in the end, I will show you how our artists are actually interacting with the USD pipeline. So our diploma project Underwater is an IP with two formats a film and a game. Uh, the film will be around three to four minutes, uh, full CG, and the game will be roughly 30 minutes of playtime uh, in an open area. And the story takes place 100 years later than uh, the film. And the style of our project will be uh, dark, gritty, and quite uh, photorealistic. This is uh, our main character, uh, Lüt. It's a close up from the face. And we also have a crispy version of Lit. <laughs> and yeah, the whole story is uh, essentially going to play um, in this huge uh, kind of world with one catch. Uh, the sky is not made out of oceans, but uh, it's not made out of clouds 
but an ocean with big uh, sort of ancient creatures uh, swimming in it. Um, yes, and yeah, basically these are some shots that we have already been working on. And as you can see, we are in the early lighting phase, but uh, this is still very work in progress and the FX animation and asset departments are all still working uh, hard at the same time. Right, and so everything you just saw is 100% represented in USD. So let's have a quick look at our pipeline to give you an overview uh, of which tools are involved. Okay, so I have this wonderful diagram here. Um, it is centered around the asset and shot.usd file. In a regular sort of old school pipeline, we would have more of a waterfall workflow where the output of one department is the input from another. But in USD, um, we have each department, each department contributing their layer to one USD file, basically. And yeah, our main uh, USD authoring tool is Houdini, uh, as we can work in native USD via uh, Solaris or the stage context. So all departments have to ingest their data via Houdini. The only exception is rigging and animation, which takes place in Maya. And here we essentially leave this native USD space and we convert the animated assets to the Maya scene format and then we ingest them back to USD in form of a USD geometry cache. And in the end, we really just send one single uh, shot.usd file to the farm, which then gets rendered with uh, Pixar RenderMan. So the shot.usd file contains a complete definition of the whole scene. Yeah, and in the next section, I want to talk about how we structure our USD stages for assets and shots. When I first started out with USD, this, uh, I found this actually quite daunting because USD is such a huge framework and it offers so many ways to set up a scene. And yeah, but I'm quite happy with uh, where we are now, so I would love to share that with you. So this is what you would essentially see in a USD file viewer uh, in the scene graph. We start with an X form primitive uh, called root with the component kind. Underneath, we have a geo, proxy, and a materials primitive. And as these are purely yours, used for organizational purposes, they share this primitive type scope, which um, prevents transforms from being applied whatsoever. And note that only the root primitive is actually an X form, uh, which should be used when you transform the asset in your scene. We also have two default variant sets here on the right. Um, called geometry and material, uh, which are stored on the root primitive as well. And each default variant is called main. And when artists want to add a shading or geometry variant, they simply already have a set prepared for them. Yeah, and the USD stage for shots is pretty much the same setup, um, except that some primitive names are a little bit different and some primitive kinds, but the overall concept is really the same. Yeah, and I want to explain now why we uh, decided to name the asset or shot root primitive root uh, that you can see here highlighted in pink. My first instinct was to actually name the root primitive after the name of the asset uh, or the shot, and this is how I would set it up in the past in uh, Blender or Maya, for example. But in USD, we don't need to do that, and we actually have benefits if the structure is the same or similar for every entity. And this concept was inspired by the USD example data set ALAB by Animal Logic. So in USD, primitive paths are used to uniquely identify a primitive. And a core workflow concept in USD is layering multiple USD files together or on top of each other. And overlaying or adding another primitive at the exact same path leads to a result calculated by the USD composition engine. And for that process, it's very convenient if the structure of all assets and shots is simply the same. And if the structure is standardized, we actually gain a lot of flexibility of how we can compose our USD stages. So in this project, we had multiple instances 
where we would, for example, um, take a shading layer from another asset to give us a base, and then just override some parts of it in a second layer to make it uni uh, look unique from the first one. Or we would reuse the same shading layer of an asset, but we would exchange the modeling layer with a broken variant of the asset. So you can see very quickly that this opens up uh, a lot of opportunities for clever workflows. And to wrap this topic up, you might wonder um, what happens if I import multiple assets in a shot or a set? Do we then have a bunch of uh, assets that are all called root? Um, to bring an asset into a USD stage, you would usually use a reference composition arc, and a reference attaches the USD layer to a target primitive path. So you don't run into name clashes at all as you essentially define the name on import. All right, so now let's uh, actually zoom out of the stage and look at how all these USD layers are structured on disk as USD files. When I started to look in how to approach uh, our project with USD, I didn't find many examples online on how to do that on a file system level. So I hope some of you who are new to USD can uh, benefit from this section. So um, our team is working on a shared network drive, which is a quite common studio setup. And we run a pretty standard folder structure with an asset and shots directory hierarchy that you can see here below, titled as production directory. And with USD, one extra folder joined in, which we call the stage folder that you can see here on the top. And this directory hierarchy only contains USD files and nothing else. Here we basically have a USD representation uh, of our whole project. The stage folder is super lightweight uh, as it only contains human readable USD A files um, that only reference the real data which is uh, located in the production directory. So if we jump a couple of folders down in the stage directory, uh, we can see that each asset and shot has one USD file that represents that entity with all the layers that contribute to it. For an asset, uh, this would look something like this. And when artists would reference an asset into a scene, they would always point to this asset.usd uh, file in the stage directory. For a shot, it would look something like this. So exactly like for the asset, we have one shot.usd file and all the department USD files are in the respective subfolder. Now, when we talk about how these uh, department files are layered together, it is actually quite straightforward. We just sublayer all the department USD A files in the main asset or shot file. The order here, of course, is important uh, and needs to be considered. And because those are all simple USDA files, we can actually look at them uh, with a text editor to, for example, debug. And this would be an example of the main shot.usda file. So it's only 16 lines, super short. And this would be a department USD file, uh, the layout file in this example. And this brings me to the next point I already briefly talked about. The actual data is stored in a production directory. So here we have a regular work directory in which artists have their scene files, like a Houdini hip file or something. And from there, they publish versioned USD layers, which are only referenced by the department USD file in the stage directory. And if an artist publishes a new version, of their task, we only have to update this one pointer uh, of the department USD file and the asset or shot has the latest state. And from a pipeline perspective, this was a switch from a pull to a push pipeline. Um, earlier, we would have some sort of asset updater that would exchange the references of an asset version to the latest one in each scene or shot. And with USD, we can now change the path a USD layer is pointing to during the publish process already. And that way our assets are always in the latest state, but we can still roll back if we need to. Yeah, and one challenge with this workflow is rendering because our asset and shot.usd file 
uh, files are essentially always live and we don't want the images on our render farm to change from one frame to another because something was updated in between. So to essentially lock or prevent our stage from changing when we send it to the farm, we can simply create a copy of the whole stage directory as it is only really a couple of megabytes in size. And this might seem kind of stupid, but it actually works quite well. Um, the prettier way would be to use a custom asset resolver, uh, which is like a USD thing um, that locks each layer version when it is running on the farm. But writing an asset resolver requires C++ skills and time, which uh, we couldn't afford so far. Yeah, okay, so after all those diagrams, uh, in the last uh, short section, I want to show you how artists actually interact with uh, the whole UC pipeline. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Houdini is our main um, authoring tool, and except rigging and animation, all the departments ingest their data via Houdini. And for that, we have uh, some special uh, department start and publish nodes. And essentially, everything in between will end up in the department USD layer. And so an artist simply drops these two nodes at the beginning and at the end, and they do their work in between, which can, for example, look something like this. We also have a publish take system, so that even for one department, multiple artists can work in parallel. An example would be two FX artists, one is maybe simulating an RPD sim, the other one some volumes, and each of them would specify their own publish take here and can therefore contribute their own sub-layer to the FX department layer. Yeah, and in each uh, publish node you can also optionally specify a shot or an asset override, which allows you to publish layers from any work file and that way we could set up uh, <laughs> sequence-based workflows and our artists can do, for example, layout or lighting on a whole sequence in just one work file. Yeah, and uh, just recently we added this new node called the Add Geo node. It is quite handy as it essentially works like a reference node, but on publish, the input from the right side gets completely flattened and exported to a location on disk controlled by the pipeline. And that way artists can create quite complex stages and all USD files are named and versioned correctly. And sometimes when working on assets or shots, it is useful to put some data into its own USD file and then load it back in, because then you can make use of composition arcs such as reference or payload. And one very common use case for this is creating a USD file that contains uh, the render geo, which gets payloaded, and one that contains the proxy geo, which gets referenced. Yeah, and if an artist then finally wants to publish their layers, uh, they simply select the publish HDAs and start the shot with publisher. And the publish process controls a couple of configure layer nodes inside of each uh, publish HDA, so the USD files all end up in the right places with the right version numbers. The publisher also handles this whole logic of creating the main department USD file and sublayering it into the main shot or asset USD file in the correct order. Yeah, so that was actually already it. Uh, I could show a lot more stuff, but I wanted to focus sort of on the most important aspects of our pipeline to not uh, take up too much time. So yeah, uh, thanks for listening. I hope there was something uh, that you could learn from this presentation. Uh, I will be also sticking around later if you have any questions or now. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the attention. Yeah, I, I guess we have time for two short questions, quick questions, any? Raise your hand. Ask now, or be silent forever. Aha. 
Thank you. Um, does this run off a usual Windows server, or do you have a Linux server that, that hosts all of the, the data then? Um, so at Animations Institute, it, it's completely Windows-based, actually. So all our workstations are Windows, and the file server itself, I'm not sure what operating system that is, but it's, yeah, we just access, this, access it via Samba, and uh, everyone is working on a, a shared network drive. So you can really see the USD files on in, in each directory and everything. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. You can mm -hmm. see it and you can look at it. And I also look at it a lot, actually, <laughs> because sometimes things go wrong. And I just open VS Code in the stage directory and I see all my USDA files. And I can see exactly what a uh, USD file references what. And then I could also adjust things manually. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. Okay, more questions? Sven. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not the tech person, but I was wondering how are your colleagues, your fellow students reacting to this kind of complex workload? Are they appreciating it? You have to train them. What is the, the idea how to get them motivated to yeah. dig into this? Yeah, super good question actually, because um, I mean, you hear it all the time, especially when you first look into USD, it's like super daunting. There are so many new words. You, need, you almost need like a little dictionary actually on your side of your desk because there are so many new words and concepts and whatever. Um, so we started this whole process, I think in January now this year, uh, like you know, learning USD, building the pipeline. And obviously the whole team kind of grew together and we, we all learned, but we also have new artists coming in now and then and I sometimes onboard them and it's really like a whole process because I'm like, okay, where do I even start, you know? Uh, and luckily with our kind of pipeline HDAs that we have at the moment, they don't need to worry about a lot of things, but uh, I, I can, for a person, I can explain, okay, you know, you do this, you do this, here you get in your geometry or whatever, and that's mostly like enough. But as soon as it gets a little bit more complex, like how do I add a variant to my asset? You suddenly need to understand so much of USD. So I think probably all the studios have actually a similar problem that switch to USD now that you really have to educate the people and invest a lot of time in it, yeah. yeah. A universal thank you to Paul. Thank you. <laughs> and you'll be around to answer more questions yes. afterwards. Thanks, Thanks. Yes. All right, thank you. And after a quick tech setup, um, we're ready for the next talk with Max Schmier. It works. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to have you all here. My name is Max, and uh, I really love fancy new technology when it comes to CGI and 3D things. So I've been looking very much into Gaussian splatting in the last few weeks. At a show of hands, who has heard of Gaussian splatting yet? Oh, quite some people, actually. Maybe half, half of the room. So a short disclaimer, I prepared to talk in German, so I'm going to do live translating. Uh, I hope it's going to work. Um, I was born in 1989, so quite some time back, and I was a very lucky uh, small baby having access to computers and such. And uh, I've ever since then really loved uh, working with, uh, yeah, with engines. And I actually started using Unreal quite some time ago. As you can see, I had a lot of hair back then. Wonderful. Um, and well, and, and that kind of brought me to uh, founding, uh, co-founding my company uh, a couple of years back, which is called B-Rex. And we're focusing on creating interactive media using game engines, such as the Unreal Engine, uh, together with our uh, partner company, Bruce B, who is a regular communications agency. So uh, to cut stuff short, we really love virtual worlds. And obviously, if you want to have virtual worlds, you need to create them in some way. And while in our projects we very often handcraft them, like regular 3D modeling and all that, there's also projects where you need digital twins of real world um, yeah, environments. And uh, as many of you probably know, there's different technologies to do that. There's photogrammetry, which has been there for a very long time to create maps 
um, and also to create 3D meshes of objects that we want to have in a virtual scene. And then there's stuff like LiDAR, which was mainly made for, well, basically uh, for, for building stuff, uh, measuring stuff for building uh, scenarios. And, and all those technologies usually focus creating a very uh, reliable point cloud of the real world, either to reconstruct the real world in a virtual scenario or to do measurements uh, or cartography. And all of those technologies have some downsides here and there. So there's one common downside, which is reflections are really a big issue if you do photogrammetry or if you do a LiDAR. So if you have a project as we had, which is uh, it's a, uh, actually a part of the Wagenhall in Stuttgart. It's, a, it's basically a container city for artists that we uh, documented or, or digitized because it's going to be torn down soon. And they obviously have a lot of windows and all that. And whenever you have reflect reflections, you tend to get very big, not very good looking holes in your meshes. So as technology develops, uh, which we all really love, um, stuff gets invented such as NERFs, uh, neural radiance fields, which is just a new way of documenting a real world uh, scene and bringing it into a virtual um, scenario. And uh, yeah, kind of nerves were for me always those, those toy guns and now they're an actual technology. That's pretty awesome. So the, the whole term is neural radiance fields. And yeah, it's one of the image-based rendering algorithms out there. There's different ones uh, available. And well, they decided to use deep learning technology to turn a finite number of images. So you basically walk around with your camera and you take images of a scene and turn those images into, um, well, into a NERF where you can assume any position or many more positions in space than those that you have actually photographed. So it's basically synthesizing uh, the, uh, the light fields on the different positions of the, the camera, which is called view synthesis. And there's a very big upside of using NERFs versus photogrammetry or LiDAR or whatever. Um, which is that reflections are no longer uh, a very large issue to, to deal with. And you only need a regular uh, RGB camera. You don't need a laser scanner or something. You can just use your phone to create something like the NERF you can see on the right. Now, um, NERFs do have a couple of downsides. This is a very, very early NERF uh, that we made uh, using a free tool, which is called Luma AI, that all of you can actually use on your phone, which is pretty awesome. But you can see it's a very splotchy and there's, the detail is not super, super great, um, which is also because it was done with a mobile camera. But um, the biggest downside is um, that nerfs are not able to run in real time. So we can't really use them for, uh, yeah, for any real time scenarios such as virtual production. Um, so I'm going to cut this short because translating it is going to take far too long. But essentially making a nerf is, similar to making a photogrammetry scan. So you're just moving around an object from all sides. You're creating your data set and then you're uh, aligning that data set using an algorithm, algorithm which is called structure from motion, which then basically assembles all of your images and is used to train the, uh, the deep learning uh, network. And yeah, and based on that, the fi finally trained nerve, you can synth synthesize, that's a hard word, new views uh, in your scene uh, using that nerve. Um, and yeah, for example, you can just nerf a car and uh, the cool thing is you have all of the reflection and all everything in the material is basically still there um, if you have the nerf in the end. But as I said, there is downsides. For example, um, training a nerf takes pretty long. Um, it's it's uh, not a very nice to edit format uh, once you have trained the nerf and uh, yeah. And of course, since we do real time, uh, we want to have the possibility to do real time stuff. So we were very lucky that this year in October, there was a paper presented at SIGGRAPH um, that uh, is called Gaussian splatting. And Gaussian splatting is kind of similar to how nerves work, but totally different um, at the same time. So the idea of the researchers was that they want to have nerves but everything a bit differently approached and in a very fast rendering and very fast training way. So to train a, a, a Gaussian split takes maybe like 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. 
um, uh, training a nerf can take hours. Um, you have a very good quality that is at least as good as nerfs in some scenarios even have better quality depending on which structures you're trying to display. And you can render them in real time with uh, like even more than 100 frames per second depending on your graphics card. And the crazy thing is it also works on mobile devices. So you can just use your smartphone to view a, uh, a Gaussian splat. On the right, you can see one of the demo scenes that was uh, shot in a park. Uh, it's a data set of, I think, <clears throat> 2,000 pictures that were then um, stitched using the Gaussian splatting algorithm. Yeah, so that's the paper um, that you can check out. And they made all of the software available. So you can just install it on your computer and use it, lo use it locally if you want to. Um, yeah, so you're probably asking yourself, how does this actually work? So the, the crazy thing is, it's no AI at all. It's no deep learning involved. It's just math. Uh, quite complex math that I don't fully understand, but we're going to get to that a bit later. So from a high up perspective, uh, 3D Gaussian, Gaussian splatting uh, basically renders a 3D scene as millions of particles, like all of those little yeah, splats, which are ellipsoids, as you can see that in on their own, they don't look as, they, as if they have any detail. They, they don't really make sense. Um, and every one of those splats has a position and an orientation that is fixed and also scaling, but, and a certain opacity. But depending on the, on the camera perspective, they can change their material, um, yeah, they, their material uh, up make, like they can change their color and, and uh, how bright they are and all that. And to render them in the end, that's why it's called Gaussian splatting, they are, uh, they are rasterized, uh, similar to how like regular engines would work. So it's, it's more something you could compare to rasterization than to ray tracing, uh, if you know the difference of those two. And then in the end, you just have, well, you have a, uh, a, an image rendered on a, yeah, in a 2D view, basically. And um, the interesting part is that most of the implementations that there are already available, they use the particle renderers of the game engines because in the end it's just particles being rendered in space. So how do you make a uh, Gaussian splat? Um, the cool thing is it's very simple. Uh, you just do the same thing you would do when doing photogrammetry. So you move around an object with your camera. And if there's no object, you still just do the same motion going up and down. And that's, whoops, that's basically how it looks. So I, I, I picked, I wanted to scan some mushrooms in my garden. So you basically just go in a, in a circle and you go up and down. I love mushroom foraging, that's my hobby, so that made sense to, to do. Although I don't know what these are. So, and that's how you create a data set. It's really, it's that simple uh, to create a data set. And then what happens with that data set is uh, complex. So a disclaimer, I'm not a math guy. I'm going to try to like explain it as a very top level thing. So um, the first thing is we need to collect all of our feature points. So there's that structure for motion algorithm that looks for very prominent features in your source material and then tries to align them and create or reconstruct a scene from that. And then in Gaussian splatting, you create all of those little Gaussians around the most important features of the scene. So you don't do that for every point, which is kind of what you try to do when you do a nerf. You just do that for the most important features. And um, that's the cool thing that it's basically a self-optimizing algorithm. And yeah, and that's the iteration part in, in the center here. Um, so basically the, the algorithm looks at itself and compares what it does with the ground truth, which is the source images, and checks if, if we are already close to the source images. And um, by basically iterat iteratively running the algorithm, um, which is uh, also shown by those blue arrows, the gradient flow is basically always looking back and, and checking if what I did looks more than the original source. And by doing that for a couple of thousand times, usually like between seven to 30,000 iterations are needed for a good outcome, you get the final splat. And there's uh, four tools on the market already, so you don't have to do any math if you want to use the technology, which is pretty cool, I think. And given the fact it just came out in October, it was a very, very quickly adapted technology, which kind of tells me there is something in there because people really want to have it. So there's a couple of uh, companies already offering tools, and most of them are actually free. Uh, I actually use on my phone Luma AI, which is really awesome. And I just, uh, yeah, if you want to try it out, you should use that. If you run it locally, 
um, which is called Inria, the, the, the locally running tool. You need 24 gigabytes of VRAM, so you need a mighty beast of a computer to run it locally. And that's how a gosh the splat from my mushroom data set looks. So if you compare it to what you would have done using photogrammetry, you have obviously all of the grass preserved, <clears throat> all of the fine structures that you would lose if you do photogrammetry or other uh, reconstruction methods. And yeah, you get this super nice scene. And if I would have like taken more of the background, you would even see more of the background as well. But yeah, so that's, that's how a splat looks in the end. <clears throat> This is a bigger data set that a uh, friend of mine took um, with uh, his drone when he, uh, while he was in Annecy. So you can see even for aerial photography, this is really awesome. Um, especially if you know that in photogrammetry you always have problems with the foliage. Especially trees are super, super hard to reconstruct in a photogrammetric scan and that works like a charm using nerves as well. Now, the question I most often hear is how do we edit this because it's not a polygon format. It kind of is a bit like a point cloud, but not really. Um, so the good thing is that in the last four weeks, uh, a couple of tools were released or updated to make it possible to edit a nerf. Um, so you have um, Cyber, which is the one that was released with the paper, which is more for viewing the, the uh, splats. Then you have a, a browser-based editing software called SuperSplat, where you can basically cut out elements of your Gaussian splat and replace it with another splat or you can also align more splats together so you have one super splat made of different smaller splats. Um, there's also plugins for Unity and Unreal that you can use. Um, yeah, what can you do with uh, Gaussian splatting? Uh, quite a bit more than you might think from my mushroom example. So you can obviously um, just picture real objects and, and places, for example, for virtual production. So if you want to kind of digitize a, a location that, uh, that you would have used photogrammetry for and taken thousands of pictures, it now is much quicker using Gaussian splatting. Um, you can also take any offline ray traced scene from Blender or Maya or whatever and just create like a data set of 40 camera perspectives of your virtual, like offline rendered ray traced scene and then reconstruct a Gaussian splat from that. And that gives you a, a virtual scene that you can just freely move the camera in, in the quality of your original ray traced render, which is pretty crazy, I think. And then obviously you can also combine Gaussian splats with polygon models or other uh, Gaussian splats and also relight scenes because you have the um, uh, the intensity of light for all of those feature points and you can just modify it adding a virtual light. Um, and I wanted to show you a crazy use case that I came across because obviously all of you have a smartphone so you can start splatting yourself and try the technology but there was one use case that I thought was a bit more special and I wanted to show it to you. So we have this data set made up of 994 single frames that I extracted from a, a, a larger film and um, I have a splat that I want to show you that I rendered in Unreal. Now the question is, who knows this hotel? Ah, Max, what, what is it? Yes, it's the Overlook from The Shining. Brilliant movie. So the data set to create this splat, which is a full 3D environment, is, is just literally five seconds from the shining intro sequence. And that's enough to, to recreate the scene in as a 3D representation, or maybe it's 10 seconds. But still, if you wanted to do this with photogrammetry, you would actually need to go around the object and you would need much more data to, to do this. And I, I checked, you can't look behind the overlook in the Gaussian splat, you won't see the, the hedge maze, because that's always the thing that critics say, where's the maze? But here you can see the scene kind of in more detail in, in three shots. So obviously it breaks apart if you change the perspective out of the, the main perspective path. But if you look from the, pretty much from the angle of the original camera, you can just edit the scene in Unreal and add stuff and particles and whatever you want to do. Obviously uh, the quality is as good as it gets from the source material. It, it, it can't do magic. magic. So that's also my first uh, conclusion, uh, shit in, shit out. If you have bad training material, it, it just doesn't look good. Um, 
one of the best ways to do Gaussian splats that I sadly was not able to try yet was using a, a 360 camera um, that you just basically yeah get and you, you take it around the location because it is actually able to work with uh, 360 panoramic images. The algorithm will still understand that and be able to do that and it gives you very good coverage. Um, then stuff like very wide scenes with content out of a very big distance works very well or uh, very close detailed scenes where the background is something you don't care about that also works nicely. Renders can flicker sometimes. Um, I think I have one more example for that. So for me, if you think about virtual production, which kind of makes sense because we have that beautiful LED wall, it's more a use case uh, for stuff that is still in the blurry part of the picture. But if you think about it, it just started in October. I think it's going to be very, very major in the next few years. It's going to improve and it might even kill the polygon. Who knows? Maybe for some use cases, it might happen quite soon, actually. So there's a very big potential, I would say. So. There is also a <clears throat> next level, whoops, now it went back to the beginning. Why did it do that? Okay, bear with me, I have to. Yeah, there we are. So um, the crazy thing is there has now been a paper um, released, I think the date is wrong, um, about Gaussian splats in movement, and I'm just going to roll the 30 second video, and that's the last thing I, I have. I sadly don't have any audio, but uh, I mean, that's a cool video about a paper. So basically, what they did is they found a way to do uh, Gaussian splatting with uh, actual uh, humans or humanoid um, uh, actors. The downside is you need one of those camera systems that have a lot of cameras, but uh, as you just saw, it's, it's you can. Uh, extremely compress uh, the data. So it's, it's different to having a, a row of polygon models playing uh, as a sequence. Uh, you just need a couple of megabytes to, to actually create a Gaussian splat that moves if you have the camera system, which most of us probably don't. But I think it's still very cool to see that the technology is already being developed further. So um, thank you very much for, for listening. I actually wanted to show you an environment on the wall, which we can't do right now. So I'm going to just show you the environment that I wanted to show you uh, as a screen capture. This is uh, the entrance of our, uh, of our office. And um, this took two minutes on an iPhone 13 to create. So I think that's just impressive to think about. And that's how it looks from the outside, like a huge mess, but yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking a bit longer. Um, Thanks, Max, for the, this user and applied perspective. Uh, I'm sure there's questions. Hunger? Yes, there's yeah. one. Thanks for the presentation. It was super interesting. Um, I was wondering, so what is like the format uh, that those Gaussian splats are stored in? And when you say you imported it into Unreal, does the DCC itself basically need to build support for Gaussian splats? And then, for example, when the DCC supports it, you could actually put a light there as well and actually light the, the thing? Yeah. So the format is called PLY, that's at least like the open format, um, which is the same format for point clouds, I believe. Um, and then obviously you need uh, a, uh, a plugin in your DCC that can understand that type of PLY and knows how splatting works. But the Luma AI plugin, that's the app that I advised you to try, is actually for free. You can just use that um, and then have the splat in Unreal. And in Unreal it's being rendered as a Niagara particle system that you can obviously light as you would be able to light any other Niagara system. Yeah. Hi, uh, super interesting talk. I was wondering, do you think it will be at some time possible to extract PBR map maps back from the nerve? Like when, so you can like, for example, 3D scan something, but you can have PBR maps from it and like, do a really, really like photogrammetry, but 
like perfect because the problem of photogrammetry is always that you basically only have a diffuse channel and you have to fake that. Yeah. So I would hope so. Um, right now, if you use one of the tools and you can in Luma or in other tools, you can actually export a poly mesh with maps, but those lose everything. So you just have a diffuse map in the end. I'm not aware of a solution that like gives you different channels for your PBR workflow, but I hope there's going to be in the future. Right now, I don't know if there's any, any way to do that. I don't think so yet, but it's going to be there for sure at some point. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for this awesome talk. Uh, you were speaking about relighting the scene or uh, the Gaussian splats in Unreal. What about reflections and the possibility of customizing them? Because when you see like reflection on the window of a car, is it just the reflection of this special sky baked in the splats or could I exchange the sky, for example? It's actually the best question ever because reflections are really different in Gaussian splats. So if, right now, if you think about having a mirror and you have a scene with a, I don't know, somebody standing in front of a mirror, then the mirror is not, the mirror is actually a space. So the mirror extend, extends backwards. So it's actually the scene being mirrored and, and having a scene here. So if you think about using Gaussian splats to reconstruct a whole scene, nothing could be behind that mirror because the mirrored image is actually splats as well in space. So you don't get a, a, a surface that is reflecting, you actually get an extrusion of the real space back into the mirror surface. So right now I don't know how you would like, you could simply edit the reflection by removing the Gaussians and putting any other splat on the other side of the mirror, but that's, that's all you could do. So one follow-up question, would there be like a possibility to add on a sky as a, let's say, polygon object plane, for example, at the position of the Uh, other sky or object that is reflected and turn them somehow into splats again uh, to be reflected? You could, I mean, if you rendered your sky in Unreal or Blender or any other tool, you could just create a data set containing images or you could do a Unreal sequence animation filming your sky and then you could just turn it into splats and then combine those two splats. That would work. Yeah. Okay, but splats reflecting splats somehow or That's, I don't pointing know. to these splits. Yeah. I don't know if that works. <laughs> you have to try. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, plenty of subjects for the um, uh, time when we present the drinks and have um, something to... Oh, so a small question. Ah. So, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> First, thank you for the talk. And I was wondering, performance-wise, um, considering Unreal for doing this Gaussian splatting, um, is it more performant um, with Nanite or with the Gaussian splatting, especially regarding like formats uh, in VR or mobile? So I, uh, there's actually some examples with Gaussian splats in, in a VR scene that you can just download for free right now. And I do really like them a lot. And the performance is great. I mean, it looks great visually. Uh, looking at it in VR and the performance is great. And I think it's really uh, a question of what you want to have in your scene. So obviously if you want to have a, a highly reflective car, um, you could either model it by yourself and then turn it into a nanite mesh, which would take a lot of time. Or you could like splatify a real car and then have it in your scene. So I think it depends on the use case. And performance wise, nanite is highly performant, uh, obviously, um, but Yeah, I, I actually I would have to compare it. I don't know if you have two cars, one in splats and one in nanite, what would run quicker? I only know that Gaussian splats are super fast. That's that's for sure. So it depends on the mesh, I would say. All right, great. Let's thank Max. And then get ready for the next Max. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, hi. My name is uh, Max as well. I'm blown away by my pre-successors. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, I run a little company called Frischvergiftung together with my best friend Willy, who's not here uh, tonight. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, a little, uh, they're actually on, right? Um, a little overview how we use stable diffusion that all of you have surely heard about, how we use it in our workflows um, beyond uh, waifu, hentai, and uh, cat, <laughs> cat pictures. So uh, we're actually trying to control stable diffusion and make it, make it what, uh, do what we want. So that's a little bit about our history. We're a club VJs uh, first, uh, like uh, that, that how we started out with. Uh, Frischvergiftung was a techno party, actually, that we threw in Stuttgart, where we started to do uh, visuals. And uh, very soon, a lot of people asked us to um, do visuals at their parties. And we grew into a, a VJ collective. And uh, um, we, we, had, we had gigs all over the place, all over Europe, the world. And um, there was one club in, uh, in Stuttgart that we basically uh, rearranged every week. So um, this is where what stuff that we do now, uh, that what we're uh, very um, known for, our huge uh, projection mappings. That was uh, two weeks ago on the Königsbau in Stuttgart. And um, yeah. So our journey with um, AI, it began with Runway ML. We had a little, um, we had a small, um, uh, um, was a couple of years ago, a project where we uh, scraped a lot of um, pictures of old historic Stuttgart pictures and um, uh, trained a little, trained a little uh, model on Runway ML. But back then it was free for like uh, five hours of training or something. Then uh, we really got a hang of it and. Uh, spent a lot of money <laughs> in there um, to create uh, possible, possible other historic Stuttgarts. And back then, that was uh, the cream of the crop was uh, that it does morphs, right? So that was our first uh, dabbling with um, AI right here. Um, so then Stable Diffusion came out, and we were completely blown away that especially that you can run it on your own computer you don't have to wait forever for Dolly or Midjourney um, to come up with your pictures it just uh, it just depends on your on your setup and you can be churning out pictures in five to ten seconds uh, which leaves a lot of room for experimentation so this was basically one of the first things I, I ever did that uh, maybe, maybe like I don't know look, look like something <laughs> And uh, yeah, what, what, what we were it instantly were hooked was prompt travel that you say that you can tell it to go from swans to um, an aerial view of Stuttgart or something. Uh, at some point, you, you can somewhat uh, see Weinsteiger um, here, maybe, or no. Nah. And in the end, it was the graphics card as plants. Nah. So uh, now it turns into plants, and at some point you can even you can see some graphics cards. So here maybe, like a, a fan or something. So um, yeah, so we experimented a lot with it. Um, how stable diffusion works is just a little, like a very small um, uh, way how you can control it. It was trained using. Um, normal images, then uh, re-noising them and telling it, um, look, look here, here's the normal picture, and this is the noise version, the noisy version of it, and now uh, please learn the way back. So in stable diffusion, you always start with the noise, and um, then um, the, the, the AI tries to find what you're wishing for in the, in the noise. So um, there's a few a lot of ways that you can actually um, have um, influence on, 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 on stable diffusion. It's, it's not only like with Dolly or something, all you can do is um, have another text prompt, try out text prompts. Midjourney now allows for um, changing the model, like what it is trained on. There's uh, a few things, but that's about it. So you can work on your text and maybe change a model. 
in um, stable diffusion, you can first of all, you can uh, first of all, you can choose the type of noise you want. Like there, there's Euler A, there's um, Fong, there is um, all kinds of different noises that you can choose from. But how it works is um, it downsamples the noise uh, to the to the latent space. In there, it tries to find um, with the conditionings they're called. It's trying to find um, your prompts or what you're wishing for. So down there, when it's when it's um, in latent space, when it's downsampled, your um, your um, options are to um, change the model completely. So you can choose from hundreds of models that other people have trained. You can, of course, um, work on your text prompts. You can use images for um, init images. So um, you can think of it as um, that you don't only take the, the, the noise, but you also, you already put something in behind of the noise. So you start with something like, uh, like the third picture. So, and of course, the AI, the AI will jump on, on, on that thing because it's already there and it's pretty much what you're wishing for if it, if it depicts what you're wishing for in your text prompt. Text prompt. So you can always, um, you can always um, try to fiddle with how much noise like is a, is a, is a, is a, um, a white noise and how much, how much do I feed it uh, the picture of what I already have maybe or it can be a scribble also, it doesn't have to be a, a photograph. Um, so I have images um, that I can work with um, to, to, guide my, to guide my stable diffusion process. I can use uh, uh, LoRas. Those are low-ranking adaption modules. Those are um, kind of like models, but they're much faster to train. You can train with like 20 images. And it's, it's a matter of yeah, like 20, 30 minutes. You can, uh, you can train them on Google Colab. Uh, it's pretty cheap uh, computing power there. And you can also uh, feed that in. And then there's conditionings like control net uh, that I'm going to uh, uh, speak of later. So you have all these. And then in the end, you can also, because all, the, all of that is being upscaled then until your uh, end image, you get your, your final image. And you can also choose your upscaler. So you have tons of uh, options to, to, to um, influence the process. This is just an example that uh, the whole system is the same, but you you change another, you you choose another noise to start with, and um, so Euler, DPM fast, DDIM, PLMS, those are all different noises, um, and you get totally different or not not so totally different sometimes um, um, results. So how do we use it in our in our workflows? Um, I told you we we do huge scale uh, projection mappings. Um, we start out um, the, the the base for our uh, projection mappings is of course we have um, a three D model. We model that. Um, we we go there. We uh, um, I, I hope we can do some Gaussian splatting soon, <laughs> but right now uh, it's hard. It's hard modeling, and um, so we can use we can use ControlNet for example. That's what I talked earlier about. ControlNet is um, a conditioning for stable diffusion that um, looks either you can either tell it to uh, look for lines in your init images, or you can tell it to um, generate a death map from the from the pictures that you that you give it. Or which is even better, you can render out a death map from your 3D model and feed it that. So. So and this is stuff we did. Um, so this takes like, yeah, 10 seconds or something, like for each iteration. Um, it's not animated yet, but um, on our media server we can take those um, we can take those textures, put it on the the whole building, and then uh, have it animate with mask in a clever way. Maybe let it let it breathe or something. I don't have videos of that yet, uh, right now with me. Um, but you can you can imagine how how long would you need for that with. Um, with uh, Photoshop or something, that that would be a day, or like you'd have to um, you'd have to yeah go into 3D probably. So stuff like that, you can just wish for right uh, here. But it's not always what you want. Man, this this might be much too too much, right? This is super baroque, but uh, stuff like that, super cool. It's right there, and you can control it completely. Yeah, stuff like this. 
would take forever to make it. So, um, another thing that we're currently working on is for Andreas Ikade. I'm sure you, you all know him. Is he here? And you get, no? Um, uh, Andreas, he, he has this set of um, Bowie, Bowie, uh, David Bowie portraits. And um, yeah, he's seen, he's seen some stuff from us at Studio Film Builder. We, we also worked with them and he's, he's seen some things. And he's always interested in, um, in tweens, right? So he has a lot of, there's quite some works from him where like stuff morphs from one stage into the other. And he was interest, like, interested, uh, can your, can they, he says, it's them, <laughs> can they do, like the, the AI, can they do tweens, right? So, um, yeah, we tried it. Uh, he gave us those 18 pictures. What we first did was um, just a, a normal blend in After Effects, right? We blended all of them uh, together and then fed that as a batch image, um, as, as a batch image in Stable Diffusion and uh, had a look what it does, right? So this is, this is like the first outcome. He was horrified <laughs> because that's not at all what he wants, right? So we actually see on, on the left side, we see uh, the input image and on the right side at the exact uh, same um, moment, yeah, well, we see what stable diffusion does. So it's, it's really trying to make like a poster, poster style uh, David, <laughs> okay, David Bowie. And uh, so this is totally not uh, Andreas style, right? Um, so next try, uh, we try to train, we try to train a LoRa, a low ranking adaption module uh, to his style. So this was with the 18 pictures um, of his. Um, you can still see the blend. Um, we did not re-noise a lot of right here so it's very very close to um to the to the original so we didn't give stable diffusion a lot of uh freedom to work so this changes when we give it a lot more freedom like denoising is 0.3 so we we add more noise so um it doesn't see that much of the of the original and i think our best shot so far was uh was just maybe so I might call that review. Yeah, and we can really see um, it does quite well, quite a good job in interpolating. And um, some of the output images they could actually be um, they could actually be drawn by Andreas. So we're and this is a work in progress. Um, we decided. Um, um, he, he decided he wants to uh, make in-betweens, like so one more step in between, he will, he, he's actually uh, drawing them now. And um, so because he wants more control, but he's quite pleased with the outcome. So that, that worked quite well, we're still at it. Um, okay, so in last week, uh, because that went quite well, we said, okay, um, Let's make another, let's, let's have another test with uh, Tanya from the Anima Animation Institute. She's a student and she's working on um, a film um, that, um, I think she's here. Ah, okay. Maybe she can, <laughs> she can uh, uh, tell you more about the intent of the film. So it's about um, finding uh, other pictures uh, for um, emotions you have during foreplay, right? Something like that. She she is nodding, and um, so we have this um, we have this one. We, she has this one shot uh, where there's snails uh, uh, moving across lips, right? And um, one of these pictures takes her almost an hour to make. Um, the whole movie has around. I, I think we she she thinks it's it's gonna be around five, six, seven hundred pictures for the three minutes that she wants to, that she wants to show at eight frames per second. So this would take forever, right? So she's at the, she's at the, at the, at the point where she needs to decide, so do I need to start drawing right now for till, till March, right? 
or is there a way that I can only draw um, every eighth pictures, eight pictures, eight eighth picture maybe, and we'll have stable diffusion do the rest, right? So yes, uh, last week we had um, we had uh, a one hour workshop. I brought uh, I brought our uh, production machine. I have uh, I have um, I do have one of those graphics card with uh, 24 gigabytes. <laughs> they, they really rule. And um, with with this kind of work, and um, yeah, so we gave it a go. So this was our input. Like the she, she already drew like uh, 20 20 um, real pictures that she digitalized. Um, she does have um, she made that in Blender. So she does the whole, the animations. She first draws that in grease mark. Uh, grease, Grease pencil with grease pencil in Blender, so 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 she has the whole animation, the whole 120 frames. She does have as an animation, which is nice because we we said okay, we can we can throw this at ControlNet and train train um, the LoRa with the with the actual pictures that she drew. So this was our first first try. Um, Again, the workflow is the same. We took the we took the 18 pictures that she actually drew, and blended them together in After Effects, and fed that into Stable Diffusion. Um, you can tell, you can still see, you can see the um, uh, the blends. Uh, they made it through to ju just in the first uh, example for Andreas. Um, uh, they're still in there because we didn't renoise so much. Um, our Second try was um, okay. Give it, a, give it a lot more. Give it a lot more watercolors, watercolory style. So we were looking for Laura for watercolor that we added. Um, looks much more like her, like her, um, um, like her drawings. So then we started. Uh, then we decided, okay, let's really train a model with her, with her pictures, um, which came out. <laughs> came out like this, so this is not what we want. This is not what we want. We were not happy. Um, this is disgusting, right? This <laughs> stuff like this. So, um, yeah, that day didn't, um, we didn't find the solution in that day. So we, we, we're not sure, is it, you know, you have three sensors, of the of the of the snail and everything, so we're not quite sure yet. Um, is it is it a problem with our training? Should we train different? Should we train differently? Do we need other pictures? Um, does it have to be a Laura? Maybe it has to be a whole checkpoint that we have to train. Um, so we're still at it, and um, yeah, this is quite nice, but totally not what we want. Again, so this this is just to show off of what ControlNet can really do, right? Because we have. The animation is like the, the path. They're they're really really cool, but um, stable diffusion is just doing whatever it wants there. And um, this was just a test. Uh, when what happens if we re renoise like like crazy and give it a lot of space? Um, yeah, how was it? A little work in progress. Thank you, Max. Uh, what a wonderful selection of um, different talks, uh, all very technical and creative. Thank you so much. Um, any questions for Max? Hi. Uh, very interesting use cases for stable diffusion. For the last one, did you use a program called EBSynth? for uh, motion interpolation, or was it just raw stable diffusion with ControlNet? Mm, there was no AB synth involved, no EB synth. Did you try EB synth? Uh, I tried it, but, but not in, 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 uh, in cooperation with um, stable diffusion. I only tried EB synth for, um, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not an AI actually, right? Because it, it takes, EB synth is this program where uh, it takes the pixel movement, uh, Information from MP4s, right? Like the the flow, and then and then transpons that to things. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people uh, work uh, tr use that for calming down uh, stable diffusion animations. I haven't tried it yet. I haven't tried it yet.
more questions. What was the name of the club where you started your VJ? Um, uh, Rocker 33. Rocker oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I did not really get the um, connection from Blender and her paintings. So she did an animation in Blender? Or yes. Okay, so you have the full animation, how it should look, and some of the frames of mm -hmm. the actual mm -hmm. style. So I th Because I was also thinking of uh, EB Thint, because mm -hmm. I saw that you can connect if you have an... Um, existing animation and an, a style you want to put on you can use uh, you can use this maybe, maybe, try, maybe, maybe. this might work but yeah. but yeah but i think her 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 um the drawings she has it's a line drawing i'm not sure if that will take the whole texture with it I, I it's think just the outlines right I, i'm not sure maybe maybe that's a good Maybe that's something we should try, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, I also tried EBSynth uh, the ah. day after we tried Stable Diffusion, and it was very successful, I think. Yes, oh, yeah. great. Uh, it's oh. not there where it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of glitches, but I have to figure out how to solve it. Okay, super. Yeah. But uh, for your question, I I did the, like the the whole animation in Blender, but it's you can do it in every 2D program. I just used to a Blender. And then I painted every sixth frame of this sequence with watercolor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one question about uh, Laura. Again, first of all, thanks for your talk. <laughs> it was nice. Um, is Laura more like a pre-trained model, which you can train furthermore with new inputs? Or is it uh, more like an architecture you can build upon or use as a starting point? It's, it's basically a new thing you, you train on, on, your, on, on its own, basically. Um, yeah, well... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm using this um, Google Collab for LoRa training, and they, I, I have I have um, like there's a drop down that what I want to build upon. So maybe maybe, maybe that's wrong what I'm saying, but it, I think I, I train on a on a pre-trained a model called Any LoRa. So and then you can condition that with like 20 pictures or something, and the whole thing uh, then only has like. Um, 200 megabytes or something compared to a full checkpoint that's the the, the, the actual model that I that I that I'm working with I, I work a lot with ref animated it is called it has like super nice outputs I think um, especially if you don't go for photorealism but more cartoony stuff um, that has around five gigabytes but the LoRa itself the trained one has like 200 megabytes or something in the end thanks Okay, maybe the last question from Paul. Okay. Before. Um, so I found the example super impressive that you showed with the Stuttgart uh, building and then applying the stable diffusion on top with the control mats. I, I wasn't aware about this whole control mat feature at all, actually, so it, it looked super cool. Um, so if you, let's say, got the task to now animate this, yeah. how would you like go ahead about this? Mm -hmm. um, Ah, that, that's something I should have shown maybe. That, that's a very good uh, example for control net. So I, I once did um, just a, a test where I uh, took um, like boxes on top of each other, right? And like almost like, um, like books or something, right? And I put, um, I made um, staples, or not staples, or like, like piles of books, right? And then I, I made a, like a camera movement through there and I rendered that out as a death map like a death sequence, right? So, so it's just a black and white, so whatever is nearer to the camera is white, and what's, what's, what's further, further is, is black. And you take that into control net, and you can just tell it um, piles of old books, then you're moving through piles of old books, but you can also tell it to, it's like futuristic skyscrapers, then those turn into futuristic skyscrapers, or you tell it um, it's like cornflakes boxes or whatever, right? So, um, you can actually animate um, like a, a camera 
in your 3D scene or have the whole thing like drop together or something or like, like animate, animate your 3D stuff and then use um, a death pass of that and um, it'll, it'll uh, uh, behave accordingly in there. It's gonna be very, very um, jittery, all right? Um, there's new techniques like, like either work with EV synth to calm stuff down or there's another conditioning now, it's called um, animate, diff, animate diffusion, um, which actually is able to create um, moving images then. So you can actually have like, like all the stuff I, I showed you now will not, um, none of the, for example, like the first example, the, the swans, like no swan ever flapped its, wing, its wings in there. It's just animated pictures that morph into each other. And with animated diffusion, you can actually have um, stuff like a swan flap its wings now. So um, to answer your question in 3D, you can work in your Blender or, or Cinema 4D in our case. And you would basically combi combine this render that you make of the depth map with the existing control map of your castle and no, it is it is the control net. So, so oh, um, okay, like the the um, you, you have stable diffusion and feed in like you, you you turn on control net and then you can give it pictures that control your stable diffusion and you can also give it like an image sequence. Okay. So you switch it on and put in um, image sequence, tell it to make one picture of each sequence, and then okay. have a look what happens. Okay. I'm not okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, did you try out the new Runway ML movement brush tool, which uh, was showcased like a couple of weeks ago? And do you have some experience about the limitation in your experiences? I haven't worked with it yet. I, I signed up for Pika Labs, tried that, and um, I, haven't, I haven't tried the Runway ML thing. It's funny how they, how they transitioned their scope all of the time, right? In the beginning, they were um, like on animation, right? Then for quite a while, they were, uh, it was runway ML was a way to like their revenue model was to rotoscope stuff with AI. And now they're back on video kind of thing. Uh, you have to show me, is it cool? Didn't try it out, so I was okay. wondering about your experience. So never mind. Okay. Okay, yeah, plenty of things to mingle in the social uh, hour now. Uh, thank you so much, Max, for that thank insight you. into your work. <laughs> and um, actually, uh, that almost um, ends the, the official contributions of the Tech Talks, but uh, we have a open microphone. So anything um, you know you want to share, uh, let us know if you're looking for people, if you have new projects that you want to bring to this audience, uh, just come up front and, and tell us. I have two things to announce. The first one <laughs> is an event tomorrow at IAO in Feingen. It's a study on the potential of metaverse and metaverse-like environments at IAO. And um, it's going to be an interesting um, uh, get-together. From what I hear, it's 80 uh, participants already, so if you have nothing better to do, um, stop by, um, uh, contact uh, Günther Wenzel from IAO, I spoke to him today. The official um, waiting list or, or anmelde list is, is closed, but you can still, um, you find his name on the, uh, on the website and he knows that uh, I'm announcing this this evening and he said, of course, everybody who's interested uh, should join. I'll be there myself. And the next one is an event which is next week. It's a so-called uh, Film Academy XR Day. It's a set of input lectures in the morning of Wednesday, starting at uh, nine o'clock with a networking breakfast. And then uh, we have uh, six input lectures. The last one will be from me and my colleague, Andreas Stan, on a location-based experience from our AU project, Emil. And if you want to, you can also sign up using that QR code to participate. It's a multiplayer free roaming experience and you can uh, get a slot to uh, test that out. It's a demonstrator of a 30 month project. So we are in month 15, so still a long way to go, but a lot of things to test. And yeah, you can see we have very interesting guests and, and small lectures, the format of this evening 
10 to 15 minutes. Um, that's it on my behalf. Thanks for showing up in such large amounts. I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun um, in the social event afterwards. And um, yeah, thanks for coming. And if you want to share anything, come up now. Yeah. Thank you.